Well, I am going to uh, welcome our next speaker. He is a person that I have got a chance to know now, and he has some uh, great, amazing, incredible ideas on what to do. We need to move forward with that, and I'm going to bring him on board right now. He is the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. He ran for Prime Minister of Canada. Unfortunately, he did not make it this time, but we know that there can be other times. By training, he's a firefighter and a paramedic, so we're in good shape. And if he is doing well in that area, he knows about how we can live. I love the title that he has, Confronting Chaos Like a Firefighter. He is a firefighter, and he has done that in Edmonton. And now he's showing us how we can use these principles in our own life to get ahead. I want you to join me in welcoming Tim Moen. Thank you, sir. Thanks. All right, is this thing on? Can you guys hear me out there all right? First of all, it's an honor and a pleasure to be speaking here. I mean, I look around this conference and I see all my heroes. Uh, it's a little bit surreal, and I just want to echo what uh, speakers like Derek Bros and Amanda Rat Ratchwitz had said that I'm no more special than any of you out there. We are all heroes in our own lives and putting order to the chaos in our own lives. Now, as I was introduced, I, I, I did run for Prime Minister of Canada in 2015. I ran on the platform. You might have heard of this uh, slogan that became popularized as we put it out there in the world. Uh, we were just looking for any slogan or meme to catch on. We really had no idea what we were doing. And the meme that we put out was called I want gay married couples to be able to protect their marijuana plants with guns. You guys ever heard that one? Yeah. That was, that, that got me on the map basically. We got interviewed on Fox News, CNN. Uh, the Canadian television station, CBC, has a version of the Daily Show called This Hour Has 22 Minutes, and those guys started making fun of me incessantly, and so we knew we were on to something. And based on the, on the power of that one little slogan and that one little meme, I found myself leading a federal party and running for prime minister six months after I had written an article explaining how voting is immoral and how we ought to abstain from the political process altogether. And so it's been a bit of a surreal trip and obviously I changed my mind and a big reason I changed my mind was because of one man, Ron Paul. Ron Paul stood on a political stage, he spoke the truth and he brought millions of people to liberty and I think we have a lot to thank him for. Uh, so today I'm not talking about my role in politics, you know, I'm a little actually disappointed with Jeff Berwick and the organizers here at Anarcho-Polco for letting a politician up on this stage. Uh, but here I am and I'm going to take the, take the podium and do what every politician does and make a little bit of a stump speech. But today I want to talk about my other career. See, when I didn't get the job of Prime Minister, I had to go back to my day job and as uh, a day job, I put wet stuff on red stuff. I fight fires. I'm a firefighter paramedic, and so I, I respond to ambulance calls and fire calls. And I noticed during my run for uh, office and, and being a leader in an organization that there was a lot of similarities between what I do as leader of the, the Libertarian Party of Canada and what I do on the fire ground as a fire officer. Uh, and I'll tell you a little story that kind of highlights what I'm talking about. A few years ago, I was called uh, to a structure fire. It was a, an apartment building, uh, about four stories high, and we saw some smoke coming out of the backside. We were the first arriving fire truck, and as the fire lieutenant, it was my job to lead a team up to the top floor and find out where the fire is and do extinguishment and rescue if needed. So I had my group of guys. We get up to the fourth floor, and we can see very clearly smoke pouring out of underneath one of the doors on the top floor of the apartment building. And so we knew that was the fire room. Now the door was locked, so we put on our breathing masks. Uh, we knew we were gonna be entering a dangerous environment and we forced the door. We broke it down and entered and started doing a sweep looking for any victims and looking for the seat of the fire to extinguish it. Now, as we made our way systematically through the apartment, I came across a figure laying on a couch and uh, it, was, it was this lady, this is exactly what I saw, 
this naked, obese lady. I was surprised to find this on the internet. This is actually a painting that sold for $30 million, if you can believe it. But it's like they went forward in time and it ripped this, this painting right out of my mind. Uh, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing when I saw that because this is what I saw laying motionless on a couch, this obese lady. Now, as I got closer uh, and the, got through the smoke and my vision cleared a little bit, I could see that her chest was moving, she was breathing, she was alive, and that, that was amazing to me. But then I looked around her and there was empty vodka bottles, there was empty Cheeto and cracker and, and chips and Doritos all laying around her. Uh, there was empty packets of cigarettes. I looked at the lady, I could see that she was, uh, she was covered in like Dorito crumbs. They were actually stuck in her rolls of fat. Uh, her, her fingers were were uh, stained yellow from, from years of smoking, and I could tell here was a lady that was addicted to immediate gratification. She had let chaos get the best of her. And so I could see she was breathing. I leaned over her, grabbed her, tried to shake her awake. Her eyes popped open. I said, fire, fire. I'm with the fire department. We've got to get out. And she looked at me, and it suddenly registered that there's this firefighter hovering over top of her, and she grabbed me around the neck and pulled me in for a smooch. She said, come here, honey. <laughs> and tried to sm she, she left lip marks on my mask. She was trying to kiss me. So I pulled back. I, I pushed her away. I said, listen, there is a fire here. We need to get out. You're going to die. And she grabbed me again and tried to pull me on top of her. And I, I pushed back and said, look, we have to go now. You're going to die if we don't leave now. And she, she curled up her face in this, like, venomous look. And in this voice that only uh, comes from 30 years of two-pack-a-day smoking, she, she puts up her middle finger and says, Fuck you! <laughs> well, they didn't teach us how to deal with this kind of situation in, in fire training, I'll tell you that. Most of the people, you know, popular media and culture taught us that they were going to be thankful to maybe be safe from this, but uh, so I grabbed her 275 pound carcass and I hauled her forcibly through that apartment through the smoke while she was kicking and screaming and swearing at me. I brought her out into the safety of the hallway and called up a team and as soon as the team was arriving to cover her in a blanket and look after her, she, I, I looked back at her and she looked at me with the dirtiest look and just called me a stream of invictives. Now, put your hands up if you've ever experienced that as a liberty activist. Doesn't that describe exactly what it's like to be a liberty activist? Yeah. You know, we, we can see very clearly the chaos around us. We can see uh, how an addiction to immediate gratification, how having false belief systems have created this bubble of chaos, and we try to alert people, and what, what thanks do we get for it? We get the middle finger, we get called all sorts of names, and uh, we wonder why we do what we do, right? But that, that's kind of the nature of mindless destruction. This is the force that we're up against. Uh, it's a, a force of chaos, and I often wonder, what happened to that lady? Like, did I actually do her any favors by pulling her out of that fire and saving her life? Uh, did I just prolong the suffering of her existence, maybe? You see, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the burning cigarette that she left in the mattress that caused the fire. Sure, that was the, the proximal cause of the fire in the same way that a bullet through the heart is the proximal cause of death, but someone had to pull the trigger. Something happened earlier than that, and I would argue that this fire was inevitable and it was written down years before. Probably as a child, she experienced a lot of trauma. Throughout her life, she avoided taking responsibility and sorting herself out, and she, she stifled that trauma with immediate gratification and all the, the addictions that were evident around her with the food and the alcohol and the cigarettes. And th this is what we face, right? This is the kind of mindless destruction we face. It's the nature of the state. It's all these little sparks, all these little uh, acts of failing to take responsibility, of uh, not thinking clearly and of, being, of letting stress and anxiety force us into doing things that we shouldn't be doing, that make our lives worse in the end. And so our job today is to figure out, well, how do we deal with that? How do we solve that? How do we be firefighters? And the first thing that we have to do 
is decide we're going to be heroes, right? And, and this is not an easy thing to do. Do you think it's easy to, to stand on a stage as a, a candidate for prime minister and talk about, in Canada, dissolving socialized medicine, for example? Do you think, I, I had one guy at a debate I was at say this. He said, this is to the libertarian candidate on the stage. I just want you to know you can take my universal health care and pry it from my cold, dead hands. And he drops the mic and the crowd erupts in applause. Feels a little bit uncomfortable, right? There's, there's some heat there. Uh, it's not an easy life trying to fend off chaos and protect other people from chaos. Um, and it requires aiming, I believe, for a life of purpose rather than a life of say, happiness or pleasure or something like that. I think constantly chasing pleasure uh, probably has bad results. And so aiming for purpose, I think, is the first step. But the problem with aiming for purpose is that it puts you in uncomfortable positions because you have to step outside of your comfort zone and move into the realm of chaos to confront it and deal with it. And that requires effort. It requires dealing with heat and stress and discomfort. And so we're not always able to do that. Some, a lot of times it's easier just to hang back, watch TV, have some Doritos, drink a beer, and relax a little bit. And then the next step after we decide we want to be a hero, decide we want to confront chaos, live a life of purpose, rather than just mindlessly pursuing pleasure around, is to sort ourselves out, be the change we want to see, right? You, you can't be a guy that is incapable of climbing up and down ladders and hope to save other people. And this is what failure to sort might look like. This is examples of me failing to sort. Uh, the, the, the top one you might recognize as yourself when you become uh, enamored with the philosophy of liberty and you can't help but want to change everyone's mind. You want to go out there and convert everyone to an anarchist, right? And you, you know, this is me at, at four in the morning or something like that, explaining to someone why they're wrong on the internet and getting nowhere uh, because I'm completely <laughs> impotent at doing that. Now, the, the picture below that is me after I stepped into a boxing ring I had no business being in. Uh, I agreed to do this fight. Some boxing promoters in Calgary said, we have uh, 1,500 people that want to watch you and Justin Trudeau box in, in a ring for charity. And of course, uh, who isn't going to take the opportunity to punch Justin Trudeau in the face? <laughs> that was me. Yeah. So I agreed to do it. Started I had a month and a half to train, which isn't much for a guy with very little combative experience. Um, but I, I wanted to punch Trudeau in the face. And so I agreed to do this charity match. I was committed. And now uh, I found myself, of course, Justin Trudeau backed out. Uh, we had a feeling that was going to happen, but I had to take a chance. And so I ended up facing a 240-pound prison guard hardened by years of dealing with violence in the penitentiary. And, well, let's just say I lost a few IQ points that night and it was a little worse for wear. I wasn't quite ready for that one. The next thing we have to do, uh, I think that firefighters do really well, is they figure out how to put out the fire. They figure out how to deal with chaos. And one of the ways they do that is through this uh, fire triangle, right? And you've all probably seen something like this before. There's heat, fuel, oxygen, uh, and, and a chemical chain reaction that propagates it. And if you deal with any one of these things, uh, you can put out the fire. So you can take away the oxygen, you can starve it, you can take away the fuel, uh, you can cool it off, deal with the heat, or there's some, some uh, extinguishing agents that actually deal with the chemical chain reaction and put the fire out that way. But my version of that when it comes to statism, which is this belief system that propagates, and does everyone agree that government is, um, emerges from uh, the, the statism that's in the hearts and minds of a population? Does everyone kind of agree with that? Yeah. And so I, I think the answer is not to, to get elected into government, which is ironic because in theory, I guess that's what I'm trying to do. But really, the, what Ron Paul did was not go, go to Congress and legislate. He got, went to Congress and he fought fires by speaking the truth and dealing with statism directly, right? And so here are the elements of statism as far as I'm concerned. There's uh, epistemic confusion, right? So there's this confusion, cl cloudy mind, not dealing in first principles. And it's, it's kind of fueled by propaganda and maybe years of indoctrination. 
There's stress and anxiety. I mean, how many people are scared of uh, environmental catastrophe or, or terrorism or, or the poor suffering or, God forbid, the roads. We need the roads. How are they going to get built? This is stressing me out. Uh, and then there's responsibility avoidance. People don't want to take responsibility in their own lives because it's hard. It's painful. And by the way, we're indoctrinated in this from day one in, in public school, aren't we? We're not responsible for our own education, for how we show up in the world. That's from an authority figure pouring down into us uh, what we ought to do. So, so they're responsible always, and never us. And then it's all held together by culture. Culture kind of inculcates us. So we, uh, my argument is if we study fire behavior, we can attack it. If we understand that culture, uh, th that we can uh, isolate ourselves from culture by coming to anarcho poco, we can help people think more clearly. We can teach people how to take on responsibility. And I'm seeing a lot of that here. Aren't you guys? There's a lot of tools that are, you're give, being given here that allow you to, to take on responsibility. That's how we fight statism. And actually, the best firefighters, uh, the best firefighter I know was actually an arsonist as a teenager. He would light grass fires, and he was fascinated by how they behaved and how they moved. Uh, and he'd watch the fire department come and put it out. And then one day, he all, his grass fire got away and almost took out a house, and he decided to smarten the hell up. And he became a firefighter. And Understanding how fire works and how statism works helps you fight it. So there, there are a lot of people out there right now who are arsonists, right? These are the politicians and that sort of thing. But we also see a growing movement of young men who are kind of arsonists, who are trolls, who are lighting the fires of statism. They're, they're trolling people. My hope is that we can convert these people to use their powers of meme warfare for good and and under, because they will understand intimately how they can spread a fire through a culture. It, it happens very quickly. The next thing is to shine your boots. Discipline equals freedom. You know, we have a lot of things to do uh, to, to tackle this problem of statum. There's a lot of tasks. And one of the things that is helpful is not waking up in the morning and looking immediately at social media and seeing all the, the mean things that the people are saying about the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. That just ruins your day, makes you ineffective. So it's good to have a, a structure and a discipline. And on the fire ground, obviously, we spend the, the first half of our day checking equipment, cleaning it, making sure it's operational. It's just an automatic response. And it, it takes away the, the requirement to constantly make decisions and make plans every moment of the day. So having discipline actually sets you free because once those things are done and taken care of, housekeeping is taken care of, now you are operational. You're able to, to confront chaos. The next thing is to put on uniforms with care, to take uh, care and, and take our responsibility seriously. Uh, uniforms have, are a double-edged sword. I see a lot of young men, and I spent a lot of time as a fire officer, teaching young men who are putting on this uniform and feeling pretty proud and having the, the public come up and thank them for their service all the time and having uh, women fight for their uh, attention, uh, it can soon go to your head that, hey, I'm a pretty big deal. Like, I'm a firefighter. You start walking around like you own the place, right? And it shows up in how you treat people, how you treat your clients. We do this too as liberty activists. When we become maybe celebritarians, right? We step, we, people recognize us as, as someone. It's, it's easy to start thinking maybe you're, you're better than other people. You, the, the ego starts to grow. And so uh, the, the example I always look to, again, is Ron Paul. I mean, imagine what it must feel like to be Ron Paul, to be recognized. Everyone wants to have selfies with you and thank you. And I mean, if any one of us were to step into Ron's skin, and take on that uniform called Ron Paul, uh, we might let it go to our heads. But here is a man that has maintained graciousness, humility, and exemplifies kindness. And, and so my argument is that we ought to look at that role we take on as a, an ideal that we'll, we should always strive to achieve, but that we never quite achieve, that we're always failing. And so it keeps us humble, keeps us working to be better than, than ourselves. The other thing that's very difficult for libertarians I have found is teamwork, right? One of, one of the, uh, our biggest strengths is that we are starkly individualistic. We, we came up through high school and through our social lives quite often on the outside, right? Like you don't see a lot of prom kings and prom queens becoming liberty activists. I mean, there's just a huge social cost you pay when you 
operate in a social group and your statue and, and identity is kind of built up by that social group. We sit back on the outside, we're not invited in, and we say, okay, well, that's bullshit. That, that thing that they're doing there, that's ridiculous. Who do these people think they are? They can't boss me around, they're not that smart. Uh, but the, the thing that I think <laughs> makes us very powerful critics of the system that we see around us is that we're also one of our biggest weaknesses. It's difficult for us to work in teams, right? Because working in teams requires negotiating. It sometimes requires um, doing things and operating with uh, an organizational leader that isn't very competent or is a bit of a schmuck, quite honestly, sometimes. And so our, our first instinct is to take our ball and go home, usually in a, bl in a rage quit and where we flame the team and talk about all the nasty things about the team, right? And my goal, you know, I talk a lot at libertarian conventions about how to create unity and loyalty to the team and how to exemplify leadership. And one of the other things that, that's part of a team that is difficult for us to understand is that there's a hierarchy there. And actually, I went to grad school, I did a master's degree where I studied how, how fire teams operate. I thought there was something maybe that the fire department could learn from libertarians, right? We use this very brittle language, command and control, orders, chain of command. It all sounds very authoritarian, and, and having that language as part of our matrix that makes up how we organize can cause a lot of problems. And so I, I looked at the ways in which uh, organizational leaders like incident commanders showed up as archons, as authoritarians on the fire ground. It usually re became uh, as a result of anxiety or fear, un unable to know what to deal with the uncertainty in front of them. And these teams were far more chaotic, but the leaders who were servants, who understood that their role was to take care of a picture that the guy inside in a fire room dealing with a fire didn't have to look at the big picture, right? And so the incident commander keeps track of in information that is vital to the success of the team that people doing the work on the inside can't. So each layer of hierarchy properly understood is a service to the people doing the actual work. And so leaders need to understand this. And now, you know, because I quit my job as a, a acting battalion chief at a fire department, ran for prime minister, didn't get the job, I'm back paying the bills. And now, guess what? I'm the probie. I'm the rookie on the floor. I'm back on the nozzle, booting in the door, uh, going in and, and tackling, putting wet stuff on the red stuff. And I've learned that I have to learn to be a servant follower as well, because I've been in those leadership positions and I understand how difficult it is. And now my goal is to support the team and do what it takes and be, have a, a grateful attitude about it. So, so serve and follow like a leader. Then the next thing that we need to do is not be paralyzed to act. And the way I approach this is having an attitudinal disposition of having the courage to act with bad information or incomplete information, but having the humility to change course when new evidence and new information arises, right? And I remember as a young liberty activist, I was very tentative to go out in the world and preach the gospel of liberty because I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know everything. And, my, and I wasted a lot of years because I was just not willing to have these conversations because I just was so unsure of myself. But this is what we face all the time. Uh, we face uncertainty. On the fire ground, we face uncertainty. The only way to put that fire out, uh, the, the only thing worse than, than making a bad decision or taking no, is taking no action at all, right? And so we have to get in there. We have to start uh, fighting the, the fire, confronting the chaos, and adjust our game plan as we go. Now, the next thing is triage, using our time effectively. Every now and then, as emergency responders, we come across a horrific scene and we can't possibly treat everyone in the way they deserve and need to be treated. There's just not enough time. And, and, so, and we are constantly in a state of triage. There are, this, this problem that we face is so huge that unless we have a system, we can't possibly tackle it. We might use our time ineffectively. This, this is how we address things on the fire ground. Uh, we, we tag people as either green, yellow, red, or black. Now, green people are walking wounded. They're people that can walk away from the accident and go stand over there. Yellow are people that are more seriously injured, uh, but they can wait a little bit of time, so maybe 30 minutes or so we can get back to them. Red people are the people we can make the most difference on. They need a critical intervention, and we can really save their life because they're, uh, they're in a state where we can actually do something. And then there are the black people who are 
sometimes uh, deceased or dead. And sometimes these people are breathing and we have to leave them because if we focus attention on them, and we see these people online, right? You get sucked into a, a conversation with a troll. This can ruin your day, right? I mean, you can spend a lot of time when you could be focusing it on people who are curious, who want to be saved. All right, I'm going to sneak through here a little bit. Um, all right, so the, the last thing I just want to leave you with is this. Uh, a few years ago, and this is a moment that changed my life. I was trapped in a house fire. I was in a hoarder's house in the basement, and I thought I was tangled up and alone in the dark, complete dark. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face, and the heat was coming down, and I thought for sure I was dead. I thought my life was over, and what flashed before my eyes was the fact that I hadn't been living a life of purpose, I hadn't been focusing on the things that mattered to me, that I had children that uh, needed my attention, that I was living too comfortably in a career that was just kind of uh, forecast for me, that I was just following this line. I, I emerged from that fire a changed man. I decided to adopt a life of purpose, and I had no goal ever to be a politician or to be leading a party or, or to be running for Prime Minister of Canada, but these opportunities opened themselves up to me because I started taking on more responsibility and nurturing my purpose in life. And so my hope to you is to uh, find your purpose, have fun. Uh, and, and I want to thank you because I have children. I want to thank you for all the work you're doing. I, I see you all as firefighters. We're facing a huge problem. This is not going to go away very easily, right? And I, I thank you on behalf of my children. We are firefighters. The fire is coming, but the heat doesn't bother us, right? The heat is how we know we're at home. The flames don't intimidate us. We control the flames. We move the flames. And when it's time, we put the flames out. And then we watch as the green life emerges and hope is renewed and a better world emerges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people. To see if we could become something more. So when they needed us, we could fight the battles. That they never could. Time, the state will know what it's like to lose. To feel so desperately that it's right, yet to fail all the same. Dread it. Run from it. Freedom still arrives. Vacate the state. Engage all the speakers. And get this man a microphone. Fun isn't something that one considers when eradicating tyranny. <laughs> but this does put a smile on my face.